I like that. Let me make sure I've got the camera on properly. All right. Okay, so last time in my rather hurried rush to get through everything, I got started talking about prostaglandins. And I want to say just a few words about prostaglandins. And then I'm going to say a couple words about leukotrienes, thromboxanes, and then we'll do a song, which I promised we would start at the beginning of today. Okay? So um, prostaglandins, as I sort of said very quickly, are interesting compounds. And I want to tell you a little bit about them. Okay? So prostaglandins have these uh, sort of ugly looking shapes here. And I told you that prostaglandins are made from arachidonic acid. Okay? Arachidonic acid is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's a polyunsaturated fatty acid that has 20 carbons. And we call it an icosanoid. Icosa meaning 20. Okay, so it's an icosanoid. It has 20 carbons. And Arachidonic acid is shown at the very top, and pr various prostaglandins are shown beneath it. And they have different names, PGE2, blah, 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 all these various things. To go from arachidonic acid to making one of these compounds below, one of the things that has to happen is you have to make a bond to make that five-membered ring. You see there's no bond up there like that. And the other thing that you have to do is you have to put some oxygens on there. So you see some oxygens that have been placed in various places on the side chain. And those oxygens and that bond that's being made give rise to the name of the enzyme that does this. So I mentioned that there were two or three names that we gave that enzyme. One of the names was prostaglandin synthase, S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. Another name that we give that enzyme is called PGE, uh, PGH synthase. That's not, the, that's not very common. And more commonly, we call it a cyclooxygenase. And the reason we call it a cyclooxygenase is because it's making a cyclic ring, that thing right there, and an oxygenase because it's putting various oxygens at various places on that molecule. So prostaglandins do a variety of things. And some of the things that they do, one prostaglandin may cause, let's say, uh, muscular contraction. Another one may cause relief. All right. Uh, some of them, um, uh, several of the prostaglandins are associated with pain, as I, as I noted yesterday. So one of the issues with people, with many people, is chronic pain. You may know somebody who has chronic pain, typically arthritis or something like that. So they're put on a dose of aspirin. And aspirin works as a pain reliever because aspirin inhibits the cyclooxygenase. And as I said yesterday, the cyclooxygenase is called a COX enzyme, C-O-X. You, you can call it a COX enzyme, by the way. Okay? So inhibitors of that enzyme are called COX inhibitors. Aspirin is one. Ibuprofen is another. And they come in various classes. They're called type 1, type 2. We won't worry about the different uh, meanings of those things here. But as you know, some people are aspirin sensitive. And it, people, there was a, a widespread belief for a while that it was the, the acid that was in aspirin that was causing the stomach problems that people were experiencing. Well, anybody who knows anything about stomach knows that's probably bullshit. Okay? And the reason why is because the stomach has way more acid than is found in that little tablet. Okay? But then you saw these things like bufferin that came along. Right? Bufferin is an aspirin. It's supposed to be good for your stomach because it doesn't have all that acid and it still causes the problem. All right? So it turns out that the pro one of the functions of some of the prostaglandins is stimulating the growth of intestinal cells. Your intestinal cells turn over, meaning that they are made and destroyed pretty quickly because they've got all these digestive enzymes in there. We talked about those earlier, right? Those digestive enzymes do a pretty good number on these cells. Well, if you inhibit the production of a compound like a prostaglandin that would stimulate their growth, if, that would mean that if you inhibit their production, you inhibit their growth. That would mean that you would have fewer intestinal cells that would appear. And you might expect that you would have ulcers and so forth 
sores that would appear in the intestinal wall for people who take aspirin for a long period of time. Now, not everybody has this happen, but some people do have this happen. And this is the reason that it's occurring. It's because their aspirin is inhibiting the production of prostaglandins. Some of the prostaglandins are needed to make intestinal cells. Yes? So is there a difference, huge difference in the sensitivity? Because like my doctor, I had an injury this yeah. summer. My doctor told me I could take 15 to yeah. 18 yeah. So um, it's a good question. How long did you take it? So she said she, you know, she had an injury. She had to take 15 to 20 aspirins a day. How long did you take it? A month. Okay. That's a. Did you experience any stomach problems? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the the people the the problems people typically have with aspirin are over long term usage. Uh, so that's a still a pretty good dose, and of course you wouldn't want to do something like that unless you had talked to your doctor. Uh, so you want to be a little careful with that. But um, as long as it's over a short period of time, it's probably not a big deal. The same is true of ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is very good for a short period of time, but over a long period of time, ibuprofen can cause problems with kidneys and other things. So, um, but it, you're right. There are sensitivities that some people have versus others, and you don't really know until people start taking it. Yeah. So. OK. Uh, so anyway, there was this search a few years ago. I'll, tell, I'll make, a, make a, a short story long, as they say. Um, there was a search a few years ago to find compounds that would inhibit certain of the cyclooxygenases. There's more than one enzyme that does this, but that, we don't need to worry about that. But they would inhibit certain of the oxygenases that wouldn't affect some of the things like stomach lining and so forth, but that would give relief for prostaglandins that were causing pain in joints. And so one of those compounds I mentioned yesterday was called Viox. And Viox was um, approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And after it got approved, they f there were some of these uh, inhibitor types that were found to cause some problems with the heart. And so they had to be uh, pulled from the market and so forth. And that was after a pretty large investment that the drug companies made in, in developing these drugs. So it was a pretty expensive uh, proposition. Okay. Well, um, I could talk for a long time about prostaglandins, and I'm not going to do that. Yes? I'm sorry? Do opioids have any effect on cyclooxygenase? They don't, that I'm aware of. Now, one of the things, actually, and I'll, I'll answer your, your a related question that you might have, is I talked about the aspirin, for example, as being a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. We call it an NSAID, N-S-A-I-D. And that would suggest that steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs exist, and they're good. And in fact, uh, there are a couple of ways of dealing with uh, inflammation and swelling and pain. One of those is with aspirin. And aspirin inhibits <laughs> prostaglandins, which work very locally. The others work by inhibiting the release of arachidonic acid from membranes. All right. So aspirin is working on arachidonic acid after it's been made so that it can't be made into these compounds. So in other words, aspirin has nothing to do with the release of arachidonic acid from the membranes. That's where it's stored in the glycerol phospholipids. The steroids that people use, like cortisol, okay, cortisol is used to inhibit the release of arachidonic acid from membranes. That's a steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Okay. Now, as far as opioids, I don't know about opioids. I, I, I've never heard of anything associated with that with um, arachidonic acid, but I, with, uh, I'm sorry, with prostaglandins, but I'm just not, uh, I'm not a, a medical um, person. I, I can't tell you definitively. Yeah. Is that a question? No. Be careful at an auction. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. All right. Well, the, the prostaglandins, as I said, uh, are interesting. They're, and there's a related set of compounds called leukotrienes. You see leukotriene here looks kind of like a prostaglandin. It's not a prostaglandin. And in fact, it's not made from prostaglandin, but it's, it's made from arachidonic acid and, um, or related compounds. Uh, one of the things about leukotrienes is that leukotrienes are implicated in things like allergic reactions, like asthma. There are some um, anti-leukotriene drugs that are used 
uh, to help reduce uh, problems associated with the, an asthma attack. And it's thought that the leukotrienes play a role in that response that the body is making. It's actually an immune response that the body is making um, in the phenomenon of asthma. OK. The last thing that I'll talk about are the thromboxanes. And thromboxanes are, in fact, made from prostaglandins. Leukotrienes are not, but thromboxanes are. They're made from prostaglandins. So we can see the cyclic ring, and we can see some other things on there. The only reason I show you thromboxanes is because, again, they have a medical interest. All right? And the medical interest is as follows. Thromboxanes help make blood platelets stickier. The stickiness of blood platelets is a big factor in blood clotting. So you want your blood platelets to be sticky at a certain level, but you don't want your blood platelets to be too sticky because what happens is if they're too sticky, you're going to form clots in places and times that you don't want them forming. If you inhibit the production of prostaglandins, you inhibit the production of thromboxanes. And if you inhibit the production of thromboxanes, you make blood platelets less sticky. So people who have conditions where the doctor is worried about blood clotting will put people on aspirin. You may know people who take aspirin routinely for this purpose. We'll put people on aspirin so that they make less thromboxane, and their blood platelets are not as sticky. Those people will, and, and this is what some people like to think of as um, blood thinner. This is really isn't what a blood thinner is, but that's what some people think of it as. There's other things that, that, that are more uh, prone to being called a blood thinner. But suffice it to say, these treatments with aspirin will, in fact, make clotting less likely. So if you go in for surgery, for example, one of the questions a doctor will ask you before you go in for surgery is, are you taking aspirin routinely? Because some doctors for like heart patients and so forth will get put on to aspirin routinely. And that can be a factor in the clotting of their blood. So if you do surgery on somebody, you don't want them bleeding to death on your, on your table, right? And while it, they probably won't bleed to death, uh, it's not making it that thin. The point is you don't want to have things like that going on if you, don't, if you, if you can avoid it. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, can you treat hemophilia or other blood-related disease with thromboxane? And the answer is no. Um, it turns out that the stickiness of blood platelets is only one factor in the clotting process. And, um, the main factors, and it's, it's unfortunate in this class we don't get to talk about clotting, but the main factors in blood clotting are a series of zymogen proteins. And if one of those is missing, then the whole system doesn't work. And that's what happens in, with hemophilia. Maybe it was a really short long illness, and so it was actually like. The name is just coincidental. Yeah. yeah. Really? It is. The name is coincidental. So it's thrombin is the thing in your blood that forms clots. You're exactly right. It's the final product of a whole series of zymogen activation. There's about 10 of them. Bang, 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 bang. And if you're missing one of those enzymes in that bang, 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 bang process, then the entire rest of the process doesn't occur, and they will be hemophiliacs. They, they can bleed to death easily. So usually what's done is they, they now, in, in today's world, they uh, genetically produce the missing protein and then give it to the hemophiliacs. So, yeah. And since, I've, since you've asked the question, I'll also briefly mention I talk about blood thinning, so I'll mention it also here. All right. So blood thinning, really, when people talk about thinning, you're not really thinning anything. Okay? But what you're doing is inhibiting the clotting. So we've talked about one strategy for reducing the clotting. That's the reducing the production of thromboxane so that you have less platelet stickiness. The other uh, strategy for that is to inhibit the action of vitamin K. So vitamin K we talked about the other day, and I said it was a factor in blood clotting. And there are drugs that are given to people to inhibit the action of vitamin K. So vitamin K is necessary for some reactions to occur on the, the um, proteins related to thrombin.
that help hold those proteins at the site of a wound. So if you inhibit, you don't need to know this, I'm just throwing this out here for you, but if you inhibit those, those, uh, the action of those proteins, then those proteins will not be at the site of the wound, and the, then the person is much more likely to bleed. So what happens is that the thinning that's happening is by giving people these uh, anti-vitamin K drugs is you're inhibiting the clotting process overall. And uh, those have to be monitored very carefully. Those can be, you can actually give a person too much of that and they can bleed to death internally. So, yes? Okay, um, I'll tell you, so you, just so you know, you don't need to know this, okay? So the, the most common one is known as rat poison, okay? It's actually known as a, as a compound called warfarin. And uh, people who are, you're just fine. Do you know somebody who takes this? Okay, so, so anyway, warfarin is a rat poison. And it works by completely thinning a rat's blood. And so if you give a person or a rat too much of these things, then what happens is they will hemorrhage and bleed to death internally. And so that's how rat poison actually works. But if they're used in moderate doses, then they're used therapeutically to reduce the likelihood of clotting in people, just like aspirin is, only if they're much more effective than aspirin is. So when people are on these, and typically you have heart patients who are on these, uh, they will have to mo go in and get monitored for their clotting ability of their blood about once a month, just to make sure they're not getting too much or too little. They would need to have just the right amount. So, but you don't need to know that. Now back to the things that you need to know. Other questions? Good, 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 good questions. You ready for a song about prostaglandins? OK. Got to sing loud. Uh, this is a song to the tune of Oklahoma. Everybody know Oklahoma? Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. OK. It's called? Pros oh, wrong one. Sorry. Called? Prostaglandins. Ready? Prostaglandins, the eicosanoids creating pain, are the ones to blame when you get inflamed. And ouch, they hurt inside your brain. Prostaglandins, every throb and ache gets magnified. If you hope to win, cyclooxygens, generations got to be denied. The Vioxx has all been recalled. So go get yourself Tylenol, and if you ache, blame PGH and Thase. We must complain that you make the aches prostaglandins, prostaglandin. D2, F1, G2, E2, prostaglandin. It's you. I can't hold my voice. <laughs> All right. OK, enough of that. Get back to this guy. All right, so um, we've now finished talking about membranes. We're going to turn our attention to nucleic acids. Okay, so the nucleic acids, of course, include RNA. They include DNA. And um, I'm sure everybody knows they're made up of nucleotides. So the building blocks of nucleic acids are nucleotides. And they're, the nucleotides themselves contain three components. So when I say the word nucleotide, here's what I want you to think of. Okay? A base, a sugar, and at least one phosphate. So when you hear the word nucleotide, that's what that means. If I say the word nucleoside, it means two things. It means a base and a sugar. That is no phosphate. If I describe something as a nucleoside monophosphate, you simply have to add everything up. Nucleoside meaning two things plus a phosphate would mean a nucleotide. So a nucleoside monophosphate or a nucleoside triphosphate, each of those would be nucleotides. And I tell you that because you'll frequently hear those uh, expressions. Nucleotide, nucleoside, nucleoside monophosphate, nucleoside diphosphate, nucleoside triphosphate, et cetera. OK. Well, what most people associate with these are the bases, right? The bases. They, don't, they, they, they think that, OK, the base is the nucleotide. And the base is, as I've told you already, only a part 
of what a nucleotide is. There are, as we've talked about already, three bases that are pyrimidines. Two of these are found in RNA, and two of these are found in DNA, and they only overlap in this one. Cytosine is found in both, thymine is found in DNA, and a few RNAs, but for the most part, we don't consider that in RNA. And uracil is found in RNA, but not in DNA. On the purine side, purines are the bigger guys. You can see the five-member the, the, the five ring and the six-membered ring. You've got adenine and guanine, and they're found, of course, in both RNA and in DNA. These are nucleosides. Okay? You don't need to know the structures, but you should definitely know that pyrimidines only have one ring. Purines have those six membered and five membered rings. You know that A pairs with G and C pairs with T, and I'll show you that in just a bit. A pairs with, what did I say? A pairs with G. Look at my gut. A pairs with T and C pairs with G. Did I say that right or did I say that wrong? I said it wrong. I, I, somebody sent me an email this morning, and they wanted to meet with me at 2 o'clock today. And I said, okay, I'll meet with you at 2 o'clock, because I looked at my calendar, and everything was good. And I got to work, and I realized that today is Wednesday, not Thursday. And I had to get a hold of the person and say, no, I can't meet with you today. So today is not a good day for me. I'm just kind of brain dead. All right. Um, nucleosides. They're nucleosides because they have a sugar, and they have a sugar attached to a base, but they don't have a phosphate. The phosphates would be attached down here on position three, if we're making a DNA, or they'd be more likely on position five. Again, my brain's not working. Position five, if we have just a free nucleotide. So if I had ATP, if I had CTP, for example, what it would have would be the cytosine ring. It would have, in this case, ribose that I'll talk about in a second, and it would have three phosphates linked off of this five prime carbon right here. That's what CTP would look like. If I had DGTP, and by the way, notice I said D, D standing for deoxy, I would have, again, guanine, I would have, in this case, deoxyribose, a sugar, and I would have three phosphates off of carbon number five right there. It's the numbering of the sugar that gives rise to the numbering of the bases in DNA. There are two kinds of sugar that are found in nucleotides. If the sugar present in the nucleotide is ribose, then that is a ribonucleotide. And a ribonucleotide is a building block for RNA. On the other hand, if the sugar found in the nucleotide is deoxyribose, then that is a deoxyribonucleotide. And that's a building block for DNA. The difference between ribose and deoxyribose is very, very simple. That oxygen is present on carbon number two in ribose. It's absent in deoxyribose. Yes, the only difference between ribose and deoxyribose is the oxygen is the, is the composition of carbon number two. If there's an oxygen present, it's ribose. If the oxygen is absent, as it is on the right, it's deoxyribose. Okay. Here are the respective nucleotides. All right. So we see adenosine, five prime monophosphate. More commonly, you're going to call that AMP. A for adenosine, M for the fact that it's a monophosphate, meaning only a single phosphate, AMP. So that would be AMP. This would be GMP. This would be UMP. And this would be CMP. In each case, we've only got one phosphate on there. If we were talking about the triphosphates, we would have a phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. 
If we were talking about the diphosphates, we would simply have phosphate, phosphate. Now, where I earlier said three is where it's linked, it's linked as we're building the RNA or the DNA. So when we go and link together two nucleotides, what's going to happen is the phosphate of one will get linked to the three prime hydroxyl of the next one. And we call it prime, all right? We call the numbering prime, five prime and three prime. And they define ends of DNA. Remember how we had in proteins, we had an amino end and we had a carboxyl end? In nucleic acids, we have a five prime end and we have a three prime end. How can we tell them apart? A five prime end will not be attached to another nucleotide. And a three prime end will not be attached to another nucleotide, but all the ones in the middle will be joined together just like the peptide bonds were. And I'll show you one in just a second. On the right side here, you see the deoxy equivalents, and you see they're virtually identical. There's DAMP, meaning deoxy adenosine monophosphate. And the only difference between these two molecules is that oxygen at position two. The same is true for each one of these pairs. Okay? Now, one exception is here with thymidine, because thymidine's in DNA, but uracil's in RNA, and when we have it present as the nucleoside, we call it uridine. Okay. Now, if we were to look at this linking together of these nucleotides, this illustrates what I'm talking about. Here's the five prime end. The five prime end is not linked to another nucleotide. It's free. In this case, it's linked to a phosphorus. At the three prime end down here, we have this not linked to another nucleotide. And this is the three prime end that's down at the bottom. Everybody with me? Okay. So just like we had amino terminus and carboxy terminus, in a nucleic acid, we have five prime end and three prime end. OK. Now, you'll notice the linkage between these individual nucleotides. Okay. In proteins, we called those linkages between individual amino acids peptide bonds, and they were covalent. And between the individual nucleotides within a chain that you can see here, the linkages are known as phosphodiester bonds. So phosphodiester bonds link nucleotides together in nucleic acids. As we've talked about already, the backbone of DNA is actually the linkage of all these sugars together. The backbone of DNA is negatively charged because of these phosphates that you can see along here. DNA and RNA both are very negatively charged. You see the bases that are oriented on the other side of that backbone. When we look at a double helix like we see in DNA, the bases are on the inside of the double helix. The backbone, which is this part, is on the outside. Now what that means then is that if we were to look at a DNA molecule, the negative charges would be on the outside and the bases would be on the inside. I want you to think back, what did I tell you about the structure of proteins with respect to hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. Where do you find the hydrophobic? Hydrophobic are on the inside, away from the water. The hydrophilic are on the outside, where it's exposed to water, right? Well, DNA is organized very similarly. The bases are relatively hydrophobic compared to the phosphates. So on the inside of the DNA molecule, we find the bases. On the outside, we find the ions. Those are the charged molecules there, the phosphates. OK. 
right? This organization of the bases on the inside allows the bases from one chain to interact with the bases of another chain. And that's what you think of as the pairing of the bases, A to T, G to C. The pairing is held together by hydrogen bonds. There's our friends again. Hydrogen bonds attract the bases to each other. T and A, thymine and adenine, are attracted to each other through two hydrogen bonds. G and C, by contrast, are held together with three hydrogen bonds. You might conclude from that that G and C are more tightly held together, and you would be correct. G's and C's are more tightly held together than A's and T's, and we'll see how that plays a role later in the process of transcription. Okay. There's the double helix. The outside, notice where all the negative charges are. See the, double, the charge on the outside. You see the bases on the inside paired with each other. Okay. Another thing that you will notice with respect to the orientation of the strands is that they are what we call anti-parallel. Anti-parallel means one strand goes from top to bottom is 5 prime to 3 prime. The other strand goes from top to bottom as 3 prime to 5 prime. Instead of being oriented like this, they're oriented like this. This would be parallel. This is anti-parallel. Okay. All right. There's the base pairing. There's the AT base pairs that I was telling you about. And there's a hydrogen bond. And there's a hydrogen bond. That's the two hydrogen bonds of AT. And no, you don't need to draw those. There's the three hydrogen bonds of a GC. And you might wonder about U and A, right? Because RNA has to make base pairs when, as it's being made. And U and A also have two hydrogen bonds. The only difference between U and T is this methyl group right here. Otherwise, they're identical. Okay. Now, what you see on the screen, you might think of DNA, well, it's just a simple double helix, right? Well, it turns out that DNA has a variety of forms that it can take. Watson and Crick in 1953 were credited with discovering the structure of DNA. And though they basically stole some data from a woman named Rosalind Franklin, and they later admitted they stole the data, nonetheless, they discovered the most common form of DNA that's found in cells. It's called the B form, and it's the form that you see in the middle. The B form of DNA is very much the form that we see whenever we see DNA drawn somewhere. And it probably occupies 99% of the structure of a DNA molecule in the cell. Okay. There are two other forms that are commonly found in cells. One form is related to the B form. It's called the A form. It was actually described by Rosalind Franklin in the same issue of Nature that Watson and Crick described the B form. Rosalind Franklin getting robbed of the discovery of the structure of B DNA was, was a very, very unfortunate thing. Rosalind Franklin was probably the premier biophysicist crystallographer of her generation. She was very, very uh, talented. She was very, very much ahead of everybody else. And she worked in a laboratory where that 
her discoveries probably weren't receiving the attention that others were getting. There were several people in the race to get the structure of DNA. Watson and Crick were two people. Linus Pauling was a third. And there's actually a very interesting story. In fact, I'm in a story mode today, so I'll tell you a story about Linus Pauling. Okay? Linus Pauling was the third person in the race for that. Watson and Crick. Rosalind Franklin and her mentor, that is the person that she, whose lab she worked in, was also there. And there was a famous meeting that was held in the early 1950s in England. Um, maybe you guys have heard this story before. In England, where um, every, all the big DNA people were going to go, because they hadn't figured out what the structure was at this point. And they went to this meeting. And Linus Pauling, who was at um, here in the US, applied to go to the meeting. And Linus Pauling was denied permission to go to this meeting. At that time, you had to have a visa to leave the country. And Linus Pauling was very well known for his opposition to the nuclear testing that was going on in the atmosphere at that time. He used to blow up nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. Okay? And Linus Pauling says, we're, gonna, we're going to destroy the Earth if we do this. And the US government was very opposed to that and denied Linus Pauling a visa to go to England because of his political views. Linus Pauling was not allowed to go to that meeting. At that meeting, Rosalind Franklin's mentor was there. And Rosalind Franklin's mentor just happened to bring along Rosalind's data. And they're all sitting around a bar one night and say, hey, what you got, what you got? Because this is what happens at meetings. And Rosalind Franklin's mentor there says, oh, here, look at what Rosalind's done. It's a true story. Watson and Crick saw it, realized from her data that DNA had to be a double helix. Prior to that time, nobody had figured out that, it was, that there was a double helix. And they figured out it had to be a double helix. They knew the spacing and so forth. And then they went and they built a model for what happened with that. Linus Pauling was later awarded a Nobel Pri Peace Prize for his work uh, against the uh, nuclear testing uh, in the atmosphere, which now, of course, is banned, which we all accept. Linus Pauling had at that time already won the Nobel Prize for his work in the structure of proteins. It's interesting to think that if Linus Pauling had been at that meeting, where they're sitting around the bar, and he had access to her data, if we might not be talking about Linus Pauling as winning three Nobel Prizes instead of two. Now, Rosalind Franklin is a sad story in itself. Rosalind Franklin was never awarded the Nobel Prize. And the reason she didn't win the Nobel Prize, a lot of people don't know. Okay, well, the, the reason was that she died before it was awarded. It was awarded to Watson and Crick, and her mentor were the three people who shared the Nobel Prize for uh, the discovery of DNA. Rosalind was not recognized, but it wasn't because that she wouldn't have been recognized. It was because she died before it happened. And Rosalind was a, was a young woman. She was not some old lady who just died, and she died of a rare cancer. And in those days, when people did x-ray crystallography, they did not use shields like we use today to protect against the x-rays. It was a macho thing. It's like wearing a helmet when you play football, right? So she did not uh, have shielding from the x-rays. And the x-rays probably what caused the rare cancer that she died of uh, shortly after the structure of DNA was discovered. So it's a sad story, sad story all around. And the only people who benefited from that were Watson and Crick. There you are. That's the way life is, I suppose. OK. Um, anyway, so I got, I got distracted here. I always get distracted. So the structure that Watson and Crick described turned out to be the one that was the most common one found in cells. We know the A form also occurs in cells. And you'll see the A form looks different from the B form. The B form looks like the spiral staircase we always think about. The A form looks like a staircase I probably would fall off of. I don't want to fit on that staircase. But it has AT and GC base pairs. It has the phosphates on the outside. It's just that it's more bent. And it turns out that bending probably has functions inside of cells. Remember I told you in about the first lecture I gave you that DNA is an enormous molecule. To fit DNA into a cell requires a lot of compacting and winding and twirling and spooling and things like that. You have enough DNA in your cells to stretch out for seven feet. That's each cell of your body, seven feet of DNA. You have enough DNA in your body to go to the sun and back. 
180 million miles of DNA you have in you right now. It's a remarkable thing. Bending and helping things to fit probably makes some sense. The third form of DNA up here is a very unusual form. In fact, when it was proposed, people said, ah, couldn't exist in the South, because it's what we call a left-handed form of DNA. What is a left-handed form? If there's a left-handed form, there must be a right-handed form. Well, it turns out if you try to twist things together into a helix, it might not seem intuitive, but in fact, there are two ways of doing it. One is as I'm drawing my fingers, and the other is the backwards way. One's called right-handed, one's called left-handed. They're actually opposite. And if you're curious and you don't understand that, you don't have to understand that, but I'll show you. If you want to see one, come to my office and I'll show you. Okay? B DNA is right-handed. A DNA is right-handed. Z DNA, which is what the one on the right is called, Z is in zebra, is left-handed. And that means that if this left-handed form is, gonna is going to form, what has to happen in the DNA of a cell is you have to have a section that's going right-handed, and then something has to happen, and for a section it goes back left-handed, and then it goes back right-handed again. Because we know that the right-handed form is by far the most predominant. And so when people thought about that, they said there's no way that you're going to have these interruptions in the DNA in a cell. Well, never say never in biology. It turns out that now we have pretty good evidence that, in fact, this form of DNA actually uh, forms. Okay? I had an undergraduate student. Okay? I got another story. This is my story day. All right? An undergraduate student. How many people here have done undergraduate research? A few. Okay? So one of the things I do at OSU is I'm the director for undergraduate research, and I help students to get involved with research labs and work with professors, and I'd be happy to help any or all of you to do the same thing. I was working um, at that time on a grant that we had that was uh, paying students to work with uh, professors. And I connected this student with a professor who was working on ZDNA. In fact, the professor who was working on ZDNA had gotten his PhD in the same lab that had discovered ZDNA. So he was pretty, pretty well known. He was pretty well um, equipped to do this. This professor had written a simple computer program to predict, based on sequence, what sequences would help favor the formation of, of ZDNA. And he told this student, who was a sophomore at the time, he told him, he said, you know, this program, here's the idea for it, but it's not fully fleshed out. Would you like to have this as a programming project, because the kid liked to program? And he said, sure. So he gave him the idea. The student took it and developed it and developed it into an incredibly powerful program for analyzing not just little tiny sequences, which is what it was designed for, but in fact it could analyze an entire chromosome of hundreds of millions of bases. Well, this was pretty cool because at the time he wrote the program, that summer, the very first sequence of the very first human chromosome was published. And so they thought, hey, wouldn't this be cool? We can analyze that sequence, because that's what his program did. And so they fed the sequence into his program, and his program spit out a whole bunch of information and says, here's where you would expect to find a Z, here's a Z, here's a Z, here's a Z, here's a Z. And he became the first person ever to map a human chromosome. He was a sophomore in college. That was cool enough. He got a publication out of that. But when they looked at the sequences, they discovered something even more interesting. And what they discovered was when they looked to see where those Z regions were, what they found was if they compared that to where the genes were, there was a pretty good relationship. Now, a human chromosome is enormous. There's all kinds of junk. You've heard of junk DNA, blank spaces. And people have wondered, how does the cell know where the genes are? Right? Well, his program suggested that the cells knew where the genes were because there was ZDNA, like a little flag saying, right here, right here, right here. Okay. Kind of a cool thing. He was a sophomore in college when he, when he discovered that. Very, very cool thing. So you never know when you get involved in a research project what it might turn into being. OK. End of stories. Um, 
Left-handed versus right-handed, we won't worry about that. Um, super coiling. Yeah, question. Yeah, it's a good question. Are there, what, what causes the structure to form or not form? And it turns out that there are things that affect whether or not the Z forms. I should pay you to say that question because you're leading right to the next thing I'm going to say, which is right here. Okay. So one of the things that causes the Z to form is if you put the DNA under certain types of stress. Let's imagine you take a rubber band. And you have a rubber band, and you hold one side of it, and you take the other side, and you start twisting it. And you twist it, and you twist it, and you twist it. What's going to happen to that rubber band? It's going to all coil up, right? It's what we call supercoiling. That's a strain. That's a stress. That's a tension that we've put into that rubber band, and the rubber band responds by coiling up. Well, the DNA strand is very much like a rubber band. Now, DNA already has a natural number of coils that it goes through. The B form of DNA has what we call 10.5 base pairs per turn. Each time we go around one turn, 10.5 base pairs. That's what we call normal, relaxed DNA. What you see on the left is normal, relaxed DNA. What you see on the right is DNA that has been supercoiled. There's been a tension that's been introduced into there, and that tension has changed the number of base pairs per turn. You might say, did it make more base pairs per turn, or did it make less base pairs per turn? And here's what I would ask you. If you take that rubber band and you do tension, 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 you agree it's going to coil up, right? What if I take the rubber band and I tension it the other way? What's going to happen? The same thing. I get supercoiling whether I increase or I decrease the number of base pairs per turn. That tension works either way. The DNA really wants to be at 10.5 base pairs per turn. If I change that from something that's too little or too much, it's tension. And that tension results in what we see on the right, which is called supercoiling. Now, getting back to her question here, what causes this to happen? There's several things that can happen with tension. There's several things that can happen with supercoiling. One of the things that happens is this. And the other thing that happens is a way to relieve that tension. And one of the ways is to change from left, right-handed to left-handed. Supercoiling can affect the formation of Z DNA. Pretty cool. Supercoiling has the effect of decreasing the size of the DNA molecule. This is a pretty big factor. Because DNA has got to be fit into a little tiny cell. Now you see this DNA here on the left and on the right. Both of them are circular. And you might say, hey, my chromosomes are linear. They're not circular. Well, they behave kind of like they're circular as far as supercoiling is concerned. But there are DNAs that are circular that are very commonly found. All bacterial DNA is circular. So what you see on the screen is exactly what you would see of bacterial DNA. It's also what you would see if you had what are called plasmid DNAs. And I'll talk about those later. Plasmid DNAs. Now, there's one last thing I want to point out in the structure of DNA that I didn't before. And I'll point it out to you, and then we'll, we'll have one more song for the day. Okay? And that's right here. It's labeled on here. And the label points out that there are what are people refer to as two different grooves in the DNA, a major groove and a minor groove. 
And the only difference between them is that the major groove has a big gap, as you see right here, and the minor groove has a little gap, like you see right there. Why do I care about that? Well, because the song I'm getting ready to play for you actually deals with that. Any questions? This is, again, a song I don't sing very well, so I've got somebody else to sing it for me. And here he is. The song is called Major Groovy, and it is A little difference in words. All right. 